This is Coda Radio, episode 180 for November 23rd, 2015. Welcome to Coder Radio, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show, taking a pragmatic look at the art and business of software development and related technology. This episode is brought to you by our two fine sponsors, DigitalOcean and Linux Academy. I'll tell you more about those great sponsors as this here show goes on. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week like a soldier established on the East Coast for his duty, but yet his reach is worldwide. Why, yes, folks, is Mr. Michael Dominic. Hey there, Michael. Hey, Chris. Hello, sir. Hello. Is there no voice? I mean, I was prepared no for voice. Mickey. I, I'm disappointed. I thought mid-intro music I had fixed a bug. Oh. That, sadly, <laughs> sadly, that was not the case. I love it. You, you know, it's not to be said, Mr. Dominic is a multitasker. You know, he is a multitasker. You got to give him that. You really do. Well, and I thought I had it. I mean, I thought I was this close. and But no, it, it's... Might as well give it a go, but no, I'm yeah. sorry. That's a, that, that's a bit of a, but a, you know, as you're coming into the show, that's a bit of a blow, as they say. Bit of a blow. And it, it is quite the kick in the face. Yeah, but. yeah. Hey, I'm kind of excited. I'm, I'm a little more jacked up than I normally am, not because I've had two energy drinks this morning, but because turns out some people take a holiday this week. I, who knew? Who knew? And uh, of these some of them more. have showed up in our chat room. So we've got a, we've got a new uh, group of people, which is nice. It's good. People over at the JBLive.tv show here on a Monday. Isn't that nice? And, you know, as we were just starting the show, I realized, speaking of blows, I have been massively negligent. And I need to come clean with the audience right here, right now. And uh, I just... I think that we should all make those businesses fail. No, it's actually, it's not that severe, but... Uh, there is some very cool Coda Radio swag that has been developed for the holidays, and I was supposed to say something last week. Swag! Sorry. Yeah, I know. No, and uh, a little birdie tells me you're probably going to get some of it, so don't worry, Mr. Dominic. I think you're going to get hooked up. Yeah. Poor. Yeah. <laughs> so here's the thing. Uh, I apologize to the audience. Uh, I messed up, and I should have told you this last week. Uh, we are doing a little bit of a drive for uh, the end of the year over at patreon.com slash today, and if you have a successful November pledge over there, at patreon.com slash today, so you still have time to get in. Uh, we're going to, in the first couple of weeks of December, start sending out swags to anybody in our Patreons. We have swag levels, and they're going to get hooked up too, but we're going to be looking for uh, like anybody in there because we're hoping to get a few more folks on so that way we can make some some serious plans for 2016. And So what we have done is we have developed swag for a lot of the shows, including Coda Radio, something specific to Coda Radio. It's a callback to some historical stuff in Coda Radio. It's brilliant. We've done it for some of the other shows, too. It's really good stuff. I, I'm not going to say anything yet, but uh, I'm... <sighs> I can't, I can't wait for you to see it. So go over to patreon.com slash today. If you want to get in, uh, we're at 559 right now. And, I mean, if you think about it, those odds are not that bad. <laughs> so get over there and try to get some Coda Radio swag. We'll be giving it away to some of our patrons at patreon.com slash today and the unfiltered patron. So I have no well. idea what this is, but can I give my top three guesses? Y you can. Yeah, you can. I, I, I cannot confirm nor deny. Okay. So there's three things I think could be, but just give us a hey -o if okay. I get close. All right, well, so here's the thing. You just I'm going to give you some context. Uh, we're from Washington State. Uh, it's very green around here. It's and weed. I'm, I, I, I can't say that, but you could continue to guess. Hmm, this is not weed. That's good. You'd probably go to jail. Um, is it Jar Jar Binks related in any way? Just stroke it a little bit. I don't believe you. I can't say. I can't say. I can't say. I can't say. Hmm. I, uh, I'll, give, I'll, see, I'll give you a hint. Are you ready for a hint? Go ahead. We've talked about it before on the show. Yeah, we talk a lot, dude. Yeah. Yeah, I know. That's the thing. <laughs> I mean, all right. It, it, could be like a, it could be a wax sculptor of Marco Arment, for all I know. You, like, know, you know what I realized, though, is we are we're gonna, we have a... Okay, so coming up on today's episode of Coda Radio, we have some big stuff coming up. Uh, Mr. Dominic, he's not going to make a big deal about it, so I'll just do it for him. There's going to be a big announcement coming from Mike. And we're going to talk about it in today's episode, and it's huge, and I'm excited, and we have a lot of other things to get to today, including some really good hoopla. Uh, and uh, did you? I don't know if you had a chance because I just added in a little bit ago, but man, did I get called out super hardcore! Apparently, you're a prophet, and I am like totally worth calling out. And so I got called to the mat in one email, and you get 
uh, you get total accolades for profit status in another email. So I, I must have myth, missed that, but I now know what my favorite email is going to be. Yeah. I haven't read it. I <laughs> yeah. Didn't see right. It, yeah. So well, yeah, there you go. So that's coming up in the episode today. But I wanted to tell you, I took a trip this weekend and I realized, uh, you know, I got to look out for our audience, you know, because it is the holidays coming up. No affiliation, no sponsorship. I don't get anything from this. I went into a candle shop this weekend and, it, and, and I realized this is something for the Coda Radio audience, and you'll hear. Well, you'll, I'll make the connection here in a second. I've never been in a candle shop, like really. Like I've been in those ones in the mall, and they just smell horrible. But I, you know, I'm talking about like. So there's this town that I live in now called LaConnor, and it's really quaint and adorable. And there is a candle shop called Reclamation Candle Company, and they make all of their own candles. And they have a whole bunch of different lines of candles, but one of the lines they have is Mandels, candles for men. And there dawned on me, this could be an excellent gift for a lot of the Coda Radio audience. Now, don't let the name persuade you, because this is going to work great for ladies, too. In fact, my girlfriend, uh, Hedia, it loves some of the mandals. In fact, she got this, uh, the Great Outdoors mandal right here, which really is a Christmas tree. But they, they renamed it because they wanted to sell it all year round. It, and I'm not joking you, is a delicious smelling candle. It really sets the work environment. It makes it smell really nice, clean. These are mandals. But you know what, Mike, they also have, and this is why I wanted to mention it for the Coda Radio audience, because it could be a good gag gift, the bacon mandal. Oh, no. Yeah, it's a candle that smells like bacon. So just imagine what a great stocking stuffer that is. There you go. I just want to give a little shout out to the Reclamation Candle Company, because the guy there, Mike, you know... We hear from some passionate people in the audience about their language of choice, especially like the Rust guys. And, you know, we just we hear from people that are really crazy passionate about their project of choice. This guy that runs this candle, a reclamation candle company, Mike, this guy is crazy passionate about candles. The, like, he's got an answer for everything you say, and it's all the, the answer is always candle. Uh, you could go in there and talk about tuberculosis, and he's got a candle that helps. Now, this guy is so candle crazy, I realized something. You know, there are geeks really for everything. Like, okay. there's train yeah. geeks, there's candle geeks, there's coding geeks. It is really something to go in to a completely different geek layer. And so I got a couple, because the guy was so passionate. I got one here in the studio. Uh, it's like um, gingerbread house. And, 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 and my girlfriend's a diabetic, so the guy's like, well, don't worry, it's sugar-free. And he's like, and she's like, oh, that's funny. No, no, really, these are sugar-free. You see, that's why we don't call it gingerbread cookie. And he goes into this entire explanation why it's not gingerbread cookie, it's gingerbread house, and it's non-sugar and blah, blah, blah. Anyways, long story short, I find it actually sets a nice mood for the work environment. So I put a link in the show notes if people are interested. I don't get any money. I was just kind of a fun trip this weekend. And I wanted to share with the audience because something I think we've touched on over the 180 episodes. Can you believe 180 episodes, by the way? One of the things we've touched on is setting the right tone for your work environment and getting in that zone and trying things like a, the Pomodoro technique and things like that to sort of set a flow are pretty important. It's, it's, it's interesting. All right, Mr. Dominic. So uh, we have a couple of things that we wanted to talk about before we get into your big announcement. Are you good? Are you good? Are you comfortable with proceeding? Are you ready? Or do you feel like we've kind of done enough stretching? If, you, if you're not ready, I don't want you to pull anything. I had no idea I was muted that entire time. Oh, well, that's okay. Um, you know, I'm even in a close terminal because I am having what we call a PG invalid representation error, which means I f something up pretty big, and I'll deal with that later. So I got something for you. I got one. I want to. Can I bring you in? Or can I bring you back yeah. into my my space? Can we? Can you step in? Okay, not, come here. Not, not my space. Tom is always a little sad. Yeah, I, but I just I just want to hug you with the Coda Radio love, and I want you to talk with me. Okay, so steps. I know you got some problems right now, okay. but listen. No, it's, it's here's good. the I mean, thing. Listen, database is not working. That's never a problem. You know what? It's, it's not a thing. And right. and it's healthcare dot gov. How often is that up? Really? Oh my God! Don't get me started on that. Do not. <laughs> so uh, I got to talk about something with you that I totally think maybe I called. What's that? And I think this is the reason I said it would be open sourced, and I got it right here. This is this is brilliant. Uh, Change Logic submitted it to our subreddit, but I think I think you already saw this as well. Server side Swift, uh. aka Perfect at Perfect.org. One language to rule them all. Wouldn't it be amazing if you could develop every aspect of your apps, front and back end, using? Swift? We think so. That's the vision behind Perfect. Perfect is the first enterprise-grade web server and web toolkit for the Swift programming language. Now, of course, this is assuming that Apple gets around to actually finishing the open sourcing, which, um, if my clock is uh, correct here, is pretty much any day now. 
With Apple committed open sourcing Swift by the end of 2015, hmm, we believe there is a bright future ahead for Perfect. We're excited about its possibility and think that you might be too. So we invite you to connect with our community and find out what it's all about. Ooh, this gets me really upset, but I was curious to hear what your take was, Mr. Dominic. Oh, Chris, Chris, tell me. Tell me, how does it feel, baby? You know, my take is probably much less entertaining than yours. <laughs> my take is, okay, that's that's nice. Mm, yeah. yeah, that probably should be my take because that's much more rational and probably would uh, promote a longer, happier life. Uh, so here's my take on it. And I, I think what it is, and and I can kind of now with some distance appreciate this and not get as upset as I used to, but it's, uh, it's, it's actually raising my blood pressure right now because it pushes these old war wounds where uh, front-end guys think they know everything. And they have no effing clue how the back-end works. They have no idea what the requirements of a server system are. And they are completely and, – and it's not just because they're dumb people. It is actually because they just have no effing idea Wait. what it takes to actually run a good server or what makes a good back-end server language. So they, they don't – they think they're so smart and so sharp, and they create all of this stuff, and then they just drop it on the server guys, and it's a complete disaster. Wow. Okay, so first of all, let, let's let's hit the break. So you know for a fact. But I'm telling you, no, no, no. I'm just telling you that. Dudes are front no, end guys, I just tell you, just come on, come on. Swift as a server language, yeah. App, in Apple's wet dream, that would be great. Okay. But give me a break. See, this is this is the problem with Apple is they don't think server first. They don't think cloud first. They don't think infrastructure yeah. first. They think device first and user first. That's great if you want an iPhone. But if you want to make something that's scalable on a server system, you know, there are a lot better people that work at creating software to specifically for that than Apple is. And so when you take something that Apple develops, Apple makes desktop and, and nice mobile shiny app software. They do not make server software. They never ever create anything from its or from the very beginning with that in consideration. Okay. Okay, first of all, remember web objects? Yeah. I do remember web objects very well. Which was an acquisition which they still managed to mangle up. Right, but Yeah, that's a fair point. I forgot that they bought it. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of Apple server technologies, and I, I, <laughs> I only had web objects. It yeah. kind of derailed that train. This is the problem, and, and this, so but here's why where. Why does this offend you? Like, well, well it does. Okay. It, well, it, so it just pushes those buttons. Here's where, when I zoom out and I look at it now with some distance, here's what I actually see: is I feel like this is a nice kind of glue. It's a nice kind of go between. Um, so it, it's kind of like there there are some people who will never have more than a few hundred you know hits on their server a day. There's or or even an hour. You know, a few hundred hits an hour. Something like this is no problem. Oh you wait, know, hey, hang on, Pippi. So are you saying that you're you're saying two different things? I, I forget about performance, right? Because honestly, I'm writing Ruby as we speak, and that's just you know whatever. Um, I don't. I, I don't think the right objection here is performance. I think the right objection is why. Well, right? no, that is so. I guess what I what, oh, if you want to go back to why I get all offended, it is there are there are entire communities and projects out there that are focused on creating something for the back end. That's better. No, no, I'm saying that this is a waste of time. Yes, that's what I'm saying. And I and and I think it's arrogant to assume. You could make something that doesn't have that focus work appropriate in that environment. And the only arrog- and the reason why the arrogance offends me is because it is basically people who don't know what they're doing making decisions about something they don't understand. Okay. Now, devil's advocate here, right? In fact, today's topic was going to be, quote, protocol-oriented programming, uh, which is a big thing that all the uh, pseudo-functional people are drooling over Swift about, right? Mm-hmm. Could you not – and I – my love of Swift is well documented. Um, could you not make an argument for that if you really, really like this protocol-oriented paradigm, and given how new Swift is, maybe it would be attracted to you, and that's not totally insane? Yeah, I don't think it is. Uh, I, I actually think there is some, like I was just trying, I guess what I'm trying to say is I can, I can envision some fairly reasonable work work cases where it actually does make sense and um, that's okay where I don't the, the where what I would the kind of statements I don't like and would offend me the arrogance that offends me is language like well what they say here at perfect.org one language to rule them all that is crap 
That kind of stuff offends yeah. me a little bit. It's not one language to rule them all in even like a tiny bit. And and so I think what it does is it throws all rationality out the door and it just sort of all in now on Swift. We're all in with n- with no rational uh, dialogue, no actual consideration at all. It's just, oh, we're all in now. That kind of stuff offends me a little bit. I think there's a, there, there is legitimate use case. And I and that is in fact, Mike, if there wasn't, Apple wouldn't have open sourced it. I, I, I still stand by the reason Apple opens is open sourcing Swift is for the server use case. Yeah, I mean, I I would argue there's also a whole use case of, you know, it's hard to be a programming language and not open source today. Well, yes, but remember, and the reason why I say this is because remember, they specifically are making a Linux port with Linux libraries. So Yeah, I mean, that's true. Yeah, Yeah, they are. So I think that is their intention. I just think it's things like perfect.org are a little ridiculous. Here's my here's my question about this. Who is this for? (laughs) <laughs> right. I think because it's for all, other arrogant front-end developers. Damn. Because the one language to rule them all thing is basically how the Node people started, right? Oh, you just write your JavaScript on both sides and be happy. But that doesn't make sense. I mean, what, why, what virtue is there in your client and server being written in the same language? Uh, really, like honestly, because what, what, then your front end guys can the, your front end guys don't have to know how a server works. And like, I mean, I don't know. I, okay, I hate to be a jerk. Realistically, I mean, like your front end guys know enough of your like they worked, you know, together, yeah. right? Like they can pinch hit on the other side. And same for your back end guys. I'm sure they could throw together a little CSS, right? Right. It, it seems. I I don't understand why this is better, and and more importantly. You know, if you're going to build something, you're going to build it in this over something battle tested like, oh, I don't know, anything else. Thanks. Rails. Exactly. That's my point. Exactly. Right. Django. Yeah. Not PHP. Yeah. I mean, this is a good alternative to PHP for crazy people. <laughs> or Go. I mean, Rust. I mean, I, I don't know. I, Although, I just, Python, Perl. I don't know. Where do you draw the line at? I don't know. Well, Bash, there, Bash. There, there, there are tons of alternatives already. There's .NET, God forbid. Yeah. Uh, really, you don't need Swift to be your backend language unless there's a reason, right? Unless there's a use case where, you know, the fact that it is more of a protocol-oriented structure of the language. And actually, you know, Mike, not to interrupt you. Go ahead. But uh, your e- the email that we're going to get to later on in the show kind of addresses the fact why if you actually just move one step ahead and everything's abstracted, it's not going to matter at all. And, and so you, uh, you kind of talked about this last week, and mm, now sure. this email we're going to talk about later today is kind of a follow-up to this particular topic uh, because I think you, you, you're basically nailing it right now. Um, but I just wanted to mention, like, if you want, it, if you want you know. to build the tease, we could yeah. actually the, – the, the, yeah, the first email we're going to read later on in the show uh, will pretty much answer that particular answer question. That question. That's my tease because you know what? Oh, we got new people here today, so I want them to know how the show works. I want them to and stick Swift around. Swift is still terrible. So, right. You know. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Well, and isn't it interesting? I think what uh, we're about to talk about today doesn't have any Swift in it at all. Oh. Not even a drop. No. Speaking of drops, let me tell you about DigitalOcean where you can get a Damn. droplet. Go over to DigitalOcean.com and use the promo code CODERDIGITAL. CODERDIGITAL will give you a $10 Bama Jamma credit. Now you're like, $10? Man. Hmm. All right. I mean, because these days, you think about it, ten dollars is not going to get you very much in gasoline or petrol, and it's also not going to get you very much as far as food goes. But you know what? It will get you a lot of server infrastructure because over DigitalOcean.com, you can get started in less than fifty-five seconds, and pricing plans start at only five dollars a month. I said five dollars a month. That'll get you five hundred twelve megabytes of RAM, a twenty gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte. Of transfer, like a boss. You start with a terabyte. <laughs> this is crazy because their pricing plans, they just go up really simply incrementally and in well, so do all the specs, including the transfer. And they got data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, London, Germany, and they got a really super nice one in Toronto where you can go F the NSA but still stay in the northern region. That's not official DigitalOcean copy. That's my interpretation of why you would build a super nice data center with 40 gigabit E connections and their fastest SSDs yet in Toronto other than proximity to Alan Jude. And their interface freaking rocks. They have a very great control panel. It's the best. In fact, I get notes from people who are like, I've heard you say they have a good control panel. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's true. I kind of see the animation on the video. Hmm. And this, these are guys who've worked in, you know, actually, it wasn't even a guy. It was, it was a gal that worked in, in, in server administration. She's like, yep, 
it is really actually quite good. And we went back and forth and reminisced about some of the old systems we had used. And it strikes me that now that DigitalOcean has been around for a while, and this was her point too, it's still not really been completely ripped off. Like, how is that possible that people have not caught up? What I really appreciate about it is when you do like a deployment of a, like a one-click application, they have a whole bunch of these. On the back end, it's really legit. Like, it's, it's deploying them often in a container. It's using code that they contribute upstream called Doku. Uh, all of the backend stuff is really nice. And, and even, like, the HTML5 console is just, like, a step above all the others because it works on your phone, it works on your Linux machine with no Flash installed, or, of course, on any other desktop. And you just get, you get everything from post right up to the login. So... You're having problems, well, I feel bad for you, son, but you just go right there to that HTML5 console, get it solved. Code or digital is the promo code you use. Go over to digitalocean.com, check them out with their all SSD infrastructure because they're cray like that and their awesome community documentation. Use the promo code code or digital and support this show. You keep us on the air. You make sure that I can show up here and talk about all these great things we talk about and Mike can show up too. And you know what else? Holy crap, you get yourself a $10 credit using the promo code Coder Digital. A big thank you to DigitalOcean for their freaking awesome services, their super crazy fast SSD infrastructure, and supporting this here show. Use the promo code Coder Digital over at DigitalOcean.com. Okay, Mike, one more story before we get into things. Just because we like to tease, Mike threw this one in here. Microsoft has a little announcement around Visual Studio Code. And Mike, I'll, I won't bury the lead, but I noticed you put this in here. So I, I didn't actually know this. I thought Visual Studio Code was already open source, but now I guess it's so officially? It, it, was, it was promised as open source. Ah. But it was one of those, we're going to do it, but you know we have all the swear words still in the repo kind of things. I see, I see. So now they've cleaned out all of the comments, all of the swear right. words, all the reference to Balmer's sweaty pits, and now we have Visual Studio Code officially right here in open source. And I guess now, when you look at this, are you any more compelled to use it? What do, you, what do you think? I mean, I actually, it seems like Adam seems to be the one a lot of people write in about. Adam seems to be the one that has the most traction these days. So I'm using Adam pretty much day to day. Uh -huh. I, I keep trying out code. Um, code has some stuff going for it. The problem is, again, I, what I'm told is that if you're using a lot of Node.js, it has a lot of great build tools and auto completion for that. But I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> so Adam's just a little more. Um, I wouldn't say friendly. I would say it's more in line with my workflow right now. The other thing too is Adam seems to just be a little more mature. It's also older, so that helps. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, they're both text editors, right? They're both kind of very don't call us sublime text. Yeah, I appreciate that. They, you know, they have great Linux support. They have Markdown support. Um, so all those things are you know right there, and and it is pretty cool to see them releasing it at the you know committing to it. now it's uh, it's Apple's turn, isn't it? Uh, let's see where Swift shows up. All right, Mike, are you ready to say here it is officially, ladies and gentlemen, right here on the Google Play Store. It's called Backpoints, and oh. it's not what you expected, is it? Oh, did I say it wrong? No, that's right. Oh, Backpoints. All right, and I, and Mike, I gotta say, I did not expect your first app to be a sports app, but damn, here it is. I'm pretty excited. So, yes, it's, uh, this is a little new for me in a lot of ways. One, we're launching Android first um, for reasons that, I don't know, I'm using Android. Android's a little easier to get on the App Store for, no review time. And, uh, yeah. The idea here is that, so, if you're familiar with wrestling, not the crazy WWE kind of guys, but actual athletic wrestling, so think high school, college, that kind of thing, you can actually score and track your presumably childs, but you could do your own or your friends, uh, matches and statistics during tournaments, during matches. May seem a little, um, let's just say, crazy soccer mommy, but actually it's kind of a big deal because yeah. like a lot of other sports wrestling, your record for the season is where you get placed in the tournaments, and in some cases, if you even qualify. So is this built using the Ionic framework like we were talking it about last week? indeed. Well, congratulations, sir. Congratulations. That's pretty cool. Very nice. Achievement unlocked. That's really nice to have it in there. Yeah, so it's um, that screen you're showing right now was a huge pain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, I'm, I'm happy it's out for obvious reasons. Uh, it is a free app, by the way. Now, the deal is you get it for free. You can track one wrestler for one year. 
because again, in wrestling, seasons aren't necessarily the same for every division. So we just give you the full year, um, and then you can upgrade to up to five for four ninety nine via Google mm, Play. Yeah, purchase. so you got multiple kids, or you want to track multiple somebody else's kids, or your yeah. your group of friends, whatever. So, uh, what what kind of I'm curious to know about um, sort of the line of thinking that got you to sort of zero in on this area of the market. So there's a couple of things at play here, right? One, I'm trying something where we're going to focus on different segments of the market to put out more products, but maybe be a little more uh, MVP focused. Um, Think about the difference between writing the 4,000th photo editor, right? Or writing something like this, which to my knowledge is the only thing of its kind on Google Play. And I did try to search. I think that's actually kind of brilliant. So what you're saying is instead of going for huge, huge numbers, uh, find a few niches that are worth exploring. Create something that takes a certain amount of time that you can predict and then see what happens and maybe do – I mean this is – you know, what what this is is this is an app that acknowledges pretty much everybody's got a smartphone now. And right. and that means there's everyday things people need to think about that they would like their smart device to make easier. Right. I mean, I mean, just to kind of use a little jokey analogy, right? This app is designed for just regular people. This is, you know, this is not going to get on TechCrunch. This is not going to be talking in a white room about the fluid aluminum design, right? <laughs> this is this is a, a, I feel, fairly well-designed app for regular people who have a legitimate need. Um, I don't know if you know this, Chris, but wrestling, particularly youth wrestling, is a huge pain to actually score. And if you're really not into sports, a lot of these are. So if you have a hmm. child that's into sports, these kind of things can be very helpful. Yeah, no kidding. You know, uh, <laughs> it's seriously, you know, when, when, when my son has mentioned uh, sports a few times, I've been like, Oh boy, man! If he gets into this, so this is just not where my head's at. Like he's talked to me right. about football and baseball and things like that, and so far nothing's really grabbed him. But uh, if he was to get seriously involved with sports like this, I would be a little lost. I would probably actually very much like to seek out an app like this. And I guess, I mean, I know I just said this, but in in that sense, that's what I appreciate about the brilliance of this. Is it really feels like? I mean, I guess what I'm trying to get at is I don't understand how you have the insight to even think about this niche because, like, this is what's this is what I is so true about the world out there is there are so many markets out there that if you can just experience it and wrap your head around it for a little bit, you can go, oh man, these people need an application like this. And that's why months and months and months and months ago, I went to a local businesses group just to kind of get my head around what their day to day needs were development wise. And it was stuff I never thought of. And then in retrospect, was obvious. And that's this kind of app. In retrospect, as a father who would be completely inept at any kind of sports, if any of my one of three kids gets into them, which is pretty high chances, I'm going to be completely inept. And this is exactly the kind of resources I would go for. And even as a father, I never even thought of this. I'm not quite – what I'm not connecting with is – where did right. the? I mean, this was this was a serious insight. Well, all right. So let, let me help you. Uh, like all of my ideas, they came at a bar. <laughs> yes. Over. Mm, what day was it? I, I think it was Hendrix Martinis. <laughs> yes. Um, and you know, uh, a good a good man named Dave and I were sitting. We worked together down and saying, okay, you know, we're we're at something of an impasse right now. We have some choices to make. You know, we could try to go and, and do something huge. We could try to do the artisan app for developers or designers. Um, and that's, you know, that's tough. Or why don't we do something a little smaller for, for the regular people, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. I think sometimes in the tech world we get a little too into, like, the crazy artisan designed or the, you know, the... The future. Uh, what, what, where is technology going right. that we can enable with these incredible mobile devices? Instead of this is a we know several people, uh, parents who have uh, actually not just sons. Girls wrestle too now. Um, boys and girls who pursue this sport, and you know they're being supportive parents, but they have no idea what the hell is going on, like because it is a very complicated sport. Um, and actually, if you look deeply in, enough into most of them, they're all fairly complicated. Um, just don't even talk to me about lacrosse. So that's where it came from. I mean, literally over a bar, Hendrix Martini, extra dry, which means no vermouth. If you're ever my bartender, do not give me vermouth. Damn it. Unhappy. <laughs> yeah, that's that's huh. and 
And wow, Chris, the, the title suggestions are getting a little rough on you. Yeah, here. I know. I know. Apparently, you know, here's my bet. My So here, what I did is I, I, I introduced the kids to technology early, talking tablets, talking laptops, talking Minecraft. Here, children, look at this. Don't don't pay attention to those sports. Now go run on the treadmill. That's uh, my... Uh, so I also do have an eight-year-old brother who's something of a little jock. Ah, yeah. That's nice for the insights, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's funny. I have a younger brother, too, younger than you would expect. And uh, yeah. so far, he hasn't gotten big into sports, but I could see how that would uh, play a role. Oh, he plays several. So. so we'll have a link in the show notes, but it's called Back Points, and you can search for it in the Play Store, and uh, you can go try it out if you have it, or maybe recommend it to folks, too. Now, that'll be the toughest, long, seriously, I would imagine. The hard slog about this is what what you've done is you've identified an obvious niche that has a need. But you've also identified probably the hardest niche to ever reach ever for this kind of thing ever. Like they don't read TechCrunch, they don't read any, they don't right. read anything uh, that has any kind of discussion about apps. So th- you are really depending on a slow slog of word of mouth, unless I'm missing something. No, and that's why it's also an annual subscription, right? Um, it's really meant to be something that you would use year after year and not have necessarily a gigantic user base, right? I mean, a gigantic initial user yeah, base, okay. I should say. Okay, so, so it's a slow... Right. S- so is that sustainable? I mean, I guess, is the, is that only sustainable if you find multiple niches to sort of do something like this in so they all are slow, sort of slowly growing and generating a base revenue? Well, I think you'd be surprised. I mean, in New Jersey, I forget the exact number, but there's roughly 20,000... Um, I think it's even just like middle school to high school kids, but someone can correct me if my statistics are wrong, who are actually in what they call fairly serious athletics, uh, wrestling in particular, actually. So it's not as small of a market as you would think. Well, and I suppose like uh, Angela just mentioned in the chat room, if you could market to coaches somehow or something like that, that would be really interesting too. Yeah. So. And that would be, you know, actually extremely good because those would be a trusted word of mouth. Interesting. Uh, well, that is really cool, Mike. Congratulations. And uh, so you feel like it was a good hands-on with Ionic, and like now you have some beginning you – have, you have literally well, beginning-to-end yeah. uh, experience now with Ionic. Yeah, I've done some Ionic projects before for right. companies, but like internal applications, nothing that you could um, – you know, one of the big challenges whenever you're selling any kind of hybrid development is show me something in a portfolio that you did with this. And fortunately, the, my portfolio – or our portfolio has tended to skew native in terms of consumer stuff, um, whereas the internal, you know, the hybrid stuff tends to be very boring inventory system stuff like that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is not so sexy as it were for the portfolio. Uh, and you know, it's interesting because you have this sort of contrast where somebody who's slogging it through with a, with a small team or they're by themselves to creating sort of niche projects, and then you have your Ubers and your your big yes. big bubble type VC funded companies. And uh, there's been more and more articles recently about this potential bubble that we are facing. Uh, there's a general sense in Silicon Valley, says this TechCrunch article, that many unicorn companies will not live up to their billion-dollar status. According to Morrison and Forrester, more than half of the highly valued startups will be private in 2016, while 7% of those will fail. And I think Mike probably has a couple of predictions of which ones those might be. But uh, while they say the while the market is never in equilibrium, Equal equilibrium. Uh, the public and the private markets have different uh, variables driving their valuations. If you look at it, though, nearly all of this stuff is sort of like unbelievable. Like you have the Salesforce Tower now, and you have all of these huge, huge expenditures. The unicorn is more like an albatross. The the entrepreneurs have to live up to their valuation, and ultimately. Raising too much money can limit their business opportunity because they have to make their business worth what they actually manage to raise. While the entrepreneur may have raised money and minimized dilution, the large valuation makes it even harder to become a public company or to become acquired. And acquirers, especially public companies, they have to behave rationally. It's a red flag when entrepreneurs delay launching their product or are not hinting at revenue goals, but boast about their hiring growth. It's satisfying when companies reach cash flow neutral, but the end game has to be creating real value in the business. And uh, uh, I don't know, maybe because you and I are a couple of guys here who bootstrap and uh, invest in our companies by the credit card, we feel like, yeah, no crap, no crap. Like 
all of these businesses that go out there and get all of this free cash from the venture fu- from the VC funds guys, but don't actually have any serious revenue models. Yeah, obviously it's a bubble. And and Mike, I know just kind of by following you on Twitter, this has sort of been an area of topic you've been following for a while. So I'm kind of curious what your thoughts are on this. All this money that gets poured onto companies, what's that? What that makes them into? And even if you have any thoughts on sort of the crowdfunding aspect of it too. Yeah, so that's a that's a pretty large question. Um, yeah, it is. I'm sorry. But, I mean, it really, I, I, you know, it's a trend I know that you've been following for a while, and it kind of seems it like it's all I converging. Mean, so, I, I think it's pretty hard to look at these valuations for some of these, especially, like, app startups. Yeah. Um, and say with a straight face that those are totally based in reality. Right? That those aren't. You know, what is the acronym people are using now? Uh, FOMA or FAMA, fear of missing out? Yeah. You know, I, it just doesn't make sense, right? It's just, it's comically large sums of money they're being given. And I've kind of discussed on the show and so have you about the, you know, we're biased because we're both doing the bootstrapping thing. So the first thing on our mind is revenue and business model, revenue business model every time. Right, where you know you you can just read Pando Daily, and, or perhaps not today because they're mm-hmm. running about a bubble. But months back, years back, even about how focusing on revenue too early is a bad thing, which may be true. Yeah, uh, how can if, that possibly if, if, be true? If you're VC backed, right? And I, I think the problem is, you know, not not to make light of people suffering because it is horrible. Because obviously, when bubbles burst, people get screwed royally right yeah. but a lot of these like even even over in new york i sometimes will go to the you know the the meetups or anything and there's a lot of like mini russ hanneman's walking around and if you're not familiar russ hanneman's the guy from uh, silicon valley who is very famous for saying i don't want to make a little money now i want to make a crap ton of money later right and he wants cars that open up and down like a billionaire <laughs> yeah <laughs> and there's a whole lot of this like oh because everybody gives you their pitch right what's your pitch and there's just like holes you could drive a truck through and you know he, he, having said that though i'm pretty skeptical right like i i would bench the bet against instagram every day yeah but right? yeah makes no sense but sure they they got out okay but some of the stuff like uh what was the one that just went down what is what was it uh home joy mm, that doesn't ring a bell they got slapped with the 1099 thing no i haven't heard about this uh, I might. There's two. There's Home Joy and Handy. I think Handy is still around. Okay. But we should we should fact check that real fast. All right. But basically, they're. Uh, I'll give you a better example. They're Uber for house cleaning, right? But but if your ah. business is Uber for noun. Yeah. I think you have a problem. Yeah. Right. I mean, and this is just one man's opinion, and. You know, right. but you know what? It, it's no joke because. Uh, because Uber is already the Uber for X. Uber is going to get into food delivery. And you know what I read an article about today? Uber is getting into flu vaccination delivery. So what? Uber can get into anything. Well, it's not like that. Uber got away with a lot of the stuff they've done, whether you think they're great or horrible or there's all kinds of crap going around about them. <laughs> yeah, that's because, true too. Because they were Uber. They were first. And, you know, the taxi unions, the regulators, no one saw it coming. And, and frankly, the government's too damn slow to react. Now they're looking for it, right? Like these cleaning startups tried to be the Uber of cleaning. And what do the IRS do? Uh, are those employees or contractors? Right. You know, and, you know, arguably I'd say kind of the cleaners were contractors because they never reported to the freaking handy office. But it didn't matter because there was so much outrage and because they were probably paying them below minimum wage, which you can't do. Um, other fun things like, okay – you have an app idea and you're raising, you know, a multi-million dollar valuation on nothing. Right. Right. On, purely, on a concept. Purely, you know, you're a, claiming stake on the concept, I guess. That, you know, I'm, I'm – that is less the case now. I'm seeing less of that. I'm seeing, you know, because I get started pitches from people talking to potential clients, all that kind of stuff. There is a sort of – Push back on no. You need to at least have developed the app first, right? You can't come in with a power. Good. I mean, that has not always been the case, though. No, it hasn't. Um, you know, but it's a double-edged sword. You could say, "Oh, all these ideas are nonsense," but you know, yeah. Instagram does exist, but 
really, that's fine. Twitter exists too. That's great. But they're struggling with actually making money, right? Right. A lot, the, of these, yes. a lot of these companies yes. are, in my opinion, and again, I know this is an unpopular idea. If you have no good way to get money from people, you're not that viable. You're just, oh, it's Homejoy. Thank you for, for checking yeah. that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Andy is still around. I knew there was one that did well and was able to convert over yeah. and one that was not. Yeah. And it just went down. Uh, yeah. Heaps of, uh, of uh, flipping or flip bacon or something. <laughs> yeah, okay. His, his name's so long it gets cut off. It looks like it's clever. Heaps of, I can't even read it's too long, but it, it was a link in the chat room. Thank you very much. JBLive.tv. I love it. It's, uh, you know, it's funny, the Square IPO, uh, in fact, I was just talking about this over dinner with somebody, it did not go super great for the no. first opening. Right? Yeah, it was kind of uh, bumpy, wasn't it? Embarrassing. It went a little better the next day, but, yeah. you know, the, maybe, and I'm not a Wall Street guy by any stretch, but it's pretty clear to anyone, I would say, that private valuations are not in line with what a similar public company would be valued at. Right. right. Yeah. So if your exit strategy for a startup is to become a public company, you're going to have a really big problem. Um, also, there used to be like 20 unicorns, and now there's like 200. <laughs> yeah, that also is a little concerning. I That's agree. That's not looking – I mean, you know, a well-funded startup used to be a couple million dollars. I'm just saying, like five years ago, a couple million bucks, you were well-funded. Let's say five, six million. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now – you know, we're seeing numbers that small public companies would actually be okay with having on their balance sheet. But that's, you know, we're family businesses that have been around for 30 years, right? Yeah. That's it's kind of, I don't know. Well, I'm, I'm wondering what is your take? Because I don't want to be the guy who rings the bubble bell. Because I, my, I don't think it's going to burst like the dot-com one did. I think it's just going to, you know, in the next, not this year, but the end of 2016, 2017, I think we're going to start to see kind of a culling of the week of the unicorns where, you know, the money really is an albatross like you quoted there. It's just, they just can't make enough money to, to justify those valuations. Yeah, that would be my expectation. Uh, I, I don't think it's going to be a pop. I don't think we're, I don't think we're going to... It's gonna not going to be a bloodbath. No one's going to let that happen, right? No one's going to let 2001 happen. Yeah, I think it's going to be a slow sort of slowdown, a deflation, if you will, of... Of you're going to hear some people still getting money. There's going to be uh, and probably some consolidation of the venture capitals too as well. But I think you're going to see more of just sort of a downward slope in activity, not so much of a oh my god, it is a it is a total disaster and we're 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 completely you know we've completely popped a bubble. I don't I just don't see that anymore. Partly because there already is so much discussion around it, so much more so than there was in 2001. But also. Because I think it's just sort of natural as some of these guys go out and they do this venture funding and they run out of money and these projects go nowhere. They're just sort of slowing down naturally on their own, sort of like natural selection. Well, like RDO, right? RDO totally got demolished by Spotify and they just uh, fairly recently filed for bankruptcy. Yeah, so, that'd be, yeah. And, and now we watch Pandora and we all wonder if they're next. Yeah. Right? But just, just one more thing. I'm sorry. Does Uber for X not sound like X.com to you? Yeah. There has Did been... There is like a, a, a tinge of familiarity in all of this. Yes. Though, right? yeah. Yes. Yeah, I was just going to say it feels very familiar. Yeah. Right. I can't remember what the most recent one was, but, you know, XYZ of X, uh, we've heard that before. And we've, I mean, that always goes the same way. Every single time. Every time. It's so funny. Uh, all right, Mr. Dominic, you know, we are talking about bugging your tech. You're talking about Jupiter Broadcasting, sort of going at it on our own and creating something kind of amazing over the long haul by self-funding. That's Linux Academy as well. And that's why I really respect where they're at now because now they're at a point where they've got a serious amount of staff. And, you know, they're at a point where they can advertise. Like they've reached that certain threshold in their business where now they can start expanding their platform at a really rapid pace. And it's kind of remarkable to see it. It's, a de it's, a, it's an educational platform dedicated to teaching you the resources and technology around the open source platforms, primarily Linux. But, of course, that includes anything that pretty much runs on Linux that makes you money or helps you create applications. So go to linuxacademy.com slash coders to find out more. I really invite you to go check them out. They've got over 1,900 self-paced courses with videos where you can obtain experience as you need it. And they have instructable, instructor help Instructable help on demand. No, it's instructor help, which is actually really kind of a unique feature. So go to linuxacademy.com slash coders to get our discount and also support this show. You can choose from seven plus distros. They automatically adjust the courseware and the virtual servers to match what you've chosen. They have scenario-based training at the Linux Academy, which I think is really slick. 
You get access to those scenario-based labs that put you in the middle of tasks common to everyday environments. You'll work in their advanced lab environments while completing these scenarios from beginning to end on live servers. So you can validate the results as you go, and you get hands-on experience. So this isn't the first time you've done something like this. So when you actually go do it in production, or you go claim, yes, I can do this, or you charge somebody for it, you've done it. That's not just good from like, you know, a business standpoint. That's just nice from a self-confidence standpoint. And as a member of the Linux Academy, you'll have the ability to ask their instructors about anything related to your course. If you have trouble understanding concepts or need clear explanations or seeking career advice, their instructors are available to you. And these are people that are dedicated and passionate about these subject matters. It's not just one of the features of their training website. It's not, you know, next to Adobe After Effects, fixing the sync and understanding Nginx, right? No, that's all they do is understanding Nginx. And they have graded server exercises. Get your work evaluated while connected to a real server. Their courses include exercises where you log into a lab server and perform specific tasks, which is super cool because they automatically grade your actions so you can see how well you did. And they're included with the Linux Academy membership. They're constantly adding new features. They've rolled out a new CDN, all HTML5 players. It's super nice, and the community is full of JB members. So if you ever get a little stuck or a little down, there's some great resources. So go to linuxacademy.com coders to support this show. And to get yourself a fantastic discount. You can spend your money on lots of things, but it seems pretty reasonable to invest in yourself from time to time. I think this is a really good resource, and I'm really glad they're a sponsor on the show because I think it's specifically a good, a good fit for you guys. So go check them out at linuxacademy.com coders, and a big thank you to Linux Academy for sponsoring oh, the Coder Radio program. All right, Mr. Dominic, moving right along in this here Coda Radio. Can you believe we're at 180 episodes, dude? That's crazy. It's fantastic. That is pretty fantastic. Look at us go. Damn, girl, I'm proud of us. All right, so <laughs> let's talk about uh, how uh, you are a prophet and I'm a complete uh, idiot. Phil S. writes in for our first feedback, the future of containers. He says, hello. Mike's vision for container-based world is already here. I live in it. We started using Red Hat's OpenShift where I work, and it's amazing. It's built on Docker and Kubernetes. Yeah, it's entirely open source and both hosted and on-premises versions. How about that, S? It does continuous integration, continuous deployment, and built-in auto-scaling and application monitoring. Just point it at a Git repository, and it builds and deploys whenever you push. Have an existing Docker image? It runs those too and it will deploy whenever there is a new image. OpenShift.com and OpenShift.org. So what do you think, Mike? Uh, Phil's already living in your new future that you talked about. Now, is this exactly true to your vision, or did you figure something maybe even a little more abstracted? I, I mean, it actually seems pretty close, though. But he it's had to kind of- pretty close. Yeah. yeah, it, it is pretty close. Is it maybe not quite as turnkey yet, though, you think? You know, I, I do think it's going to be a little more magical. But he he's he's pretty damn close. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's so you're basically close. a prophet is uh, is essentially what we know now. So uh, you know my words do bring uh, faith and solace to people. So that's how we go. Uh, that's how we roll. All right, Brian. Oh, there he's always there. Yeah. Oh, you bet. There yeah, you bet. So Brian Knoll writes in because uh, Knoll's totally legit as a last name. He says, I'm a new listener to the show. I love it. We got a whole bunch of new listeners today. And, and I'm racing through the old episodes and really enjoying them. And one of them, you briefly mentioned, Coda Radio is not for the type of people who would listen to my, a My Little Pony podcast. Well, he really? frowns. Yeah, I don't actually remember saying that at all. But apparently I said it. He says, a lot of developers like ponies, Chris, including me. I even have evidence to prove it. I point you to FIM++ programming language, a okay. language developed by fans of the show. So I took a little look-see, and I went over to the esoteric uh, language uh, wiki, and I looked it up. Uh, F FIM++ is an object-oriented language that's made by fans of My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, which takes its name from the first letters of the show's subtitle. In syntax and structure, it's inspired by Java. The original idea was published on October 4th, 2012, one of the bloggers in the Esquarian Esqu Daily, which I believe the Esquarian Daily, or es es wow. uh, yeah, I don't. Do you know what that name is from the show? I kind of, I've heard it before, but 
Do you know what the Esqueria I or something? Know, uh, I know a couple ponies. I don't know what a square. I, well, Esquarian comes from the root of horse, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Es- Esquire. Yeah. yeah. So but, you know what they couldn't. So basically, Mike, here you go. Uh, uh, they not only not only do they have an actual language, F I M plus plus, but Mike, uh, linked here in the show notes, I've got the Google Doc spec, and oh, oh yeah, no, we got a, we got a full on spec, uh, and it's. Uh, it's, they're not joking around here with the spec. Uh, I've got it linked in the show notes. If you guys are crazy, if you guys are crazy, I mean interested, uh, <laughs> it is really long. Uh, if you can see this the table of contents here, I don't know if you can get a concept of how this thing is nineteen pages long. They're pretty serious. Yeah, they are okay. pretty serious. And then Mike, to top it all off, uh, up on GitHub here we have FIMPP, which is the interpreter. For FIM plus plus a GPL P, a GPL oh, wow. re- yeah yeah it's been released under the uh, public three GPL three uh, it's a, uh, a, a it is uh, right here you well, can well, use wait, job- wait, of course it's GPL friendship is magic after all right, right? so if uh, yes exactly <laughs> uh, so yeah, there you go they have an interpreter for it you've got uh, the spec out for it uh, so apparently my hate on ponies needs to come to an end right now I didn't even know I said that I didn't so, even. So- I don't recall saying that because I know several ponies. I know, uh, let's see, there's Twilight Sparkle, there's Fluttershy, Applejacks. App. Which one is Applejack? She's the is one. The- she's the one that's like kind of. Uh, I think she's kind of like uh, um, got, like, yellow Apple color, Apple. but she's got like yeah, spots yeah. on her kind of rear end there. Who's the one who flies? Rainbow Dash. I, th- I think, think a like, lot of them flies. can fly now. No, I think I a think lot of them fly. can fly. Oh, see, I'm not. I'm not yeah. doing it. But this makes a lot more sense to me than Swift on the server. Yeah, I mean that show is intense, and if you got little kids, but, man, they'll they'll get sucked into that thing. I tell you what. So there you go. Now there's a programming language based on it. Chris, be honest. Be honest. Yeah. You have a My Little Pony themed bedroom. I wish. I wish. <laughs> Man, friendship is happiness. Well, Mike. Uh, Magic. All, Magic. Chris. Yes. All I can think about it is uh, it is now, now that we're done here, it's time for people to go get your app and then eat some turkey if they're in the U.S. It's. Uh, do you have any kind of uh, turkey plans? I don't know what you're, what are you, what are you doing as they? I am going to my in-laws uh, where friendship is less magical. Yes. Yeah, I am. Uh, I'm going to the family uh, with my girlfriend and Angela. So that's going to be interesting. Wait, 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 <laughs> wait, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. I feel like I missed something fairly significant here. Yeah, I'm bringing them both because you know, I mean, Did kick you out again? No, you see, no, you know, you see. Well, Ange and I, Ange and I got a separation a while ago. Uh, we divorced a while ago. Uh, and, and so my family loves Ange and my, they, they love my kids and we all get along great. It's all very amicable, actually. It's, it, you can go watch the faux show if you have questions, but we're all going together to Thanksgiving. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Uh-huh. Not, not to trivialize your family's suffering, but you separated from Angela yeah. and I wasn't your first call. Uh, we texted, we just, I didn't tell you why. I mean, those naked pics were just me sort of on it. You were my rebound. I, uh, oh, yeah. is that only am for well, yeah, but I plan to rebound several times, so I mean that should be fine. Well, this this is definitely a downer. So uh, <laughs> we probably should have, yeah. You know, let's just cut it back to where we talked about the ponies. Well, I tell you what, Mike, I'll give you a report when I come back. We'll we'll regroup and and we'll see how we did. We'll see how we survived. We'll come back. We'll commiserate together, and uh, we'll see if we're both still standing. Because I think both of us, you know, go into the holidays and we almost end up feeling more exhausted than if we had just worked. Actually, I know that's the case for both of us. If we just worked through the holidays, we would have felt a lot better. Oh yeah, I'm definitely working. I'm going to my. I'm, my uh, people listen to this show. Uh, <laughs> You're not working, but you'll uh, – hmm. Uh, Let's no. just say a server that may or may not exist may or may not go down, and I may have, quote, no You know choice. what you could do? You know what you could do, Mike, is you could use this time to be like – you use this time in the show to be like, uh, my work is super serious, and uh, I mean I love my family, but I, you know, I might have to bring my laptop with me just because of how important work is right now. You my could, laptop is strapped to my back at all times. You like could couch it. So you, can couch, you can use the show to couch it with your family. That's what's great about the Coda Radio program. And I hope a lot of people as they're going out to their family events are listening to the Coda Radio program and they can come back and they can commiserate with their family. Wouldn't that be nice? I think that'd be pretty nice. And they could tell their family to download Backpoints and give it a five-star review. I'm not even asking you to buy the in-app purchase. No, just go give, go give it a download and then tell people how much you like the app. That'd be a nice thing to do. You can find a link in the show notes. Don't forget coderadio.reddit.com to give us your Thanksgiving experience or anything else you'd like over on our subreddit, jblive.tv, to watch us live on a Monday. We do this at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. Go check out Mike. At Dumanuko on Twitter, at Chris LES is for me, and at Jupiter Signal for the network. 
all that shenanigans going down over there. All right, everybody, thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of Coda Radio, and we'll see you right back here next week. <laughs>